I grew up in Chicago, Illinois in the 50s. Uh, my mother and father were deaf. Mm -hmm. uh, I used to go to the, the Chicago club and be deaf with them. I thought Santa Claus was deaf because the Santa we had there was deaf, you know, I mean, I, my first language is American Sign Language. Right, Daniel, let's start with you. You are portraying a real person drawing from true life. So the kind of research must have been insane for this. How did you try and move away from an impersonation and make Chairman Fred your own? Yeah, it was a, it just had to make a decision um, that it, it was an interpretation as opposed to impersonation which is a kind of a, a scary decision to make because he was just saying, this is what I think about um, who he is. You know, this is how I see it. This is how it, it feels coming through me. Um, and, um, and understanding that there, but it's also understanding that this is what's also um, needed for a narrative. You know, it's like, it's in a narrative. It's not Chairman Fred in his actual life, living his life, you know, it's, it's him in a narrative. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that was, um, that was that was challenging but then you just have to whatever decision you make you just got to commit to it and just believe right. in it you know and then be uncompromising about it mm -hmm. do it with conviction and then just put my head down and just put all the things in place to, to support me with with my decisions mm. and clark there are lots of films about the vietnam war or the american war as they refer to it as well in the film this is different why did it stand out for you when you read the script you protested the vietnam war when you were younger how was it then playing a vet so far from your own sensibilities um, I just felt that I've come um, so far away from the experience uh, that I wanted to reconnect in one way and also to be part of the conversation that I knew that uh, would be motivating Spike to write this film. Um, having gone back to the States and, and seeing the, um, the homeless vets and the way that some of these men and women have been kicked to the curb after uh, serving, I... I wanted to be a part of a conversation that said, wake up, mm. you know? Um, also for myself personally, when I was protesting against the war, uh, I was only about 17 years old at the time and I had no idea of what, um, what these people were going through. Um, and in preparation for that, we were all uh, introduced to, to vets. Mm -hmm. uh, we were also introduced to um, infantrymen who had stayed behind and stayed in Vietnam. Um, and so all of that was, was a, a, it was almost like a personal journey. It was a personal odyssey I had to go through to, to, uh, um, to, to do this. And, and it, there's, there's a, how can I say no to like working with Delroy and, and, and Chadwick and the rest of my bloods, you know, I mean, just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd be a fool to say no. <laughs> <laughs> I think you know, that's something so, you would have regretted. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and yeah, I was um, sharing yesterday that, that um, when you look at the names of the characters, what you'll see are the names of the temptations, you know, these are the names of the temptations. So there's a lot, there's a lot in this, you know, and looking at it just uh, on, on, the first viewing, I guarantee that you will have missed about 70% of the nuances and information that is coming to you. Yeah. That's yeah. such a great reason to go and rewatch the film. I had no idea. Check I did not know mm. that. Um, Paul, I want to come to you. Sound of Metal is genuinely unlike any film that I've seen before. What about the script jumped out for you? What made you want to be so involved with this film? Oh, well, uh... Just the, I, I could tell it was sensitively uh, written. Uh, obviously he had done a lot of homework over the years, 13, 14 years trying to put this thing together. Mm -hmm. But what jumped out at me was uh, the portrayal of deaf people as addicts, which, you know, if you look at the film history of uh, uh, deaf people being portrayed on the screen, not authentically, played by hearing people mm -hmm. for one thing, uh, when there are plenty of deaf actors out there that are highly talented. Uh, the thing that deaf people have said to me about it is, thank you for showing us as addicts. And you think, well, that's kind of a, but you know, they're always the, the ancillary character. You see me in the elevator, goodbye, or the comic relief. Mm -hmm. These are people, that deaf people want to be shown as, uh, we have the same foibles, the same struggles that you have. We, we just can't hear. Mm -hmm. So that was what was refreshing to have a deaf sober house. Mm -hmm. 
when deaf people go through addiction programs, their hearing programs, and as an interpreter, I would follow them, shadow them through their experience, you know. But to have a deaf sober house, the other way you're almost set up to failure. But there is a deaf sober house in here in uh, Los Angeles called Awakenings, deaf owned, deaf run, deaf counselors, deaf addicts treating other addicts. So I thought it was so refreshing. Uh, so that was one thing about the script, but Darius Martyr just did a fantastic job mm. researching the culture that I grew up in. Well, tell me about that culture. Was that something that you were sort of, were you in the role of advisor on set as well as actor for that? Well, he had his own deaf advisors on the set. He had three of them. Uh, I grew up in Chicago, Illinois in the 50s. Uh, my mother and father were deaf. Mm -hmm. uh, I used to go to the, the Chicago club and the deaf with them. I thought Santa Claus was deaf because the Santa we had there was deaf, you know? I mean, I, my first language is American Sign Language. Mm -hmm. I learned English. Secondly, uh, wow. my mother bought me. She, I, so English is, you know, was very foreign to me. Mm -hmm. But um, at the, think about how, the, how dark that time was uh, when uh, my parents were advised by their hearing parents, don't you dare have children, you won't be responsible. Well, my mom and dad had four. And they worked, they were blue collar workers from Chicago. They bought me a radio. Uh, they had a TV going on. I had record players and well-meaning aunts and uncles uh, with uh, the 78 RPMs, you know, in those days. I listened to Frank Sinatra, the Spike Jones band. And I was talking at a very early age, but I was signing mm. first. So that is my, that's my uh, growing up uh, with deaf culture, with the deaf community that really taught me the meaning of unconditional love. Mm. They were, my father felt very oppressed by uh, the hearing man. Mm. There was no technology. There was, there was no uh, phone uh, captioning for TV, for movies. And interesting enough, Daniel, at the time that uh, Fred Hampton was running around Chicago with the Deaf Panthers, my mother used to call herself uh, a Deaf Panther because she was fighting for her rights at the very same time. Her, mm. you know, there, there was no, uh, uh, wheelchair access for people on sidewalks, all that kind of thing that we've shifted into now, which is a much more accessible world, including mm -hmm. the world of, of the deaf. Wait, can I ask Paul, Paul, sorry, when did you learn, when did you learn English? Sort of like what age was that then you learned well, to speak? Well, you start signing when you're like, because uh, the first sign you learn is milk, milk. So you don't have to be a couple of months old to, to know that. English, however, is about I think three or four years old, something like that. And, it was, and wow. hearing people, hearing people were, because my father was, uh, and his friends felt just oppressed as all the more I can think of. I, I developed this, uh, this feeling of, you know, silent hatred for what was happening to my parents and, and my uncles and aunts that were deaf, you know, this mm -hmm. family that was raising me. And I had to get over that because I, I was untrusting of hearing people. I was in the middle of, there was no sign language interpreting profession. So I was negotiating with the gas company, negotiating for a car, mortgage. I remember the day my mother and father, they put money down on a house and they had to get the money back. They're, here I was put in that position to go and get this deposit back for my parents going How old through me. I was about, I don't know, eight years old. My God. Eight years old. It's a lot of pressure. To, now today, CODAs, I'm a child of deaf adults, CODAs we call ourselves. They're, they're not put in that position because we have professional sign language interpreters. You know, I've been doing it myself professionally in the court system in Los Angeles. I'm a legally certified interpreter. I work in court system uh, for 35 years. But imagine uh, as a boy trying to go into a courtroom and there's no interpreters. My dad's got a ticket. Deaf people can drive? Yes, they can drive. I mean, there's so much... <laughs> After, listen, when I was a kid, I would say my parents are deaf. And they'd say, oh, I'm sorry, they're dead. No, they're deaf. <laughs> oh, they're deaf. Oh, the irony. And, oh, and exactly. And then they would think that, and I swear to God, I'm not making this up. Two or three times as a kid, they would go, I see the wheels turning. They go, you mean your parents actually had sex? I'm like, well, what are you thinking? My goodness. It's, do I have to draw the scene out for you or something? I mean... <laughs> Uh, that's but I'm, I'm just make, I'm telling you this when people are so afraid of something they don't know yeah. deafness blindness even a person that uses a wheelchair so that's a scary proposition to go because you I got the feeling that they thought they might catch it mm -hmm. um, even people that watch the sound of metal 
Sound of Metal, uh, musicians are very afraid to approach the subject of losing this, losing your hearing. 